Hi, um, my name is Megan Clark. I am a first year PhD student studying telecomputing here with Dr. Quentin Stout. Um, has anybody here noticed that serial computers died? They disappeared, they're gone. Like if you look around in this room, laptops, they're all multi-core. Your desktops are all multi-core. Even your phones now are dual core oftentimes. Um, it's really hard to find a processor these days unless it's an Arduino or something that's part of an embedded system. There's usually a bunch of them networked together anyway, so it's parallel. This, uh, what, I mean, what happened to it? Like, where did the serial computers go? We ended up actually hitting the physical limits of how fast we can make a single CPU. Clock frequency has not experienced any kind of improvements for almost 10 years now. Um, the chip manufacturers saw this coming a mile away, and so what they ended up doing was they just started putting multiple cores together on a single chip. So hardware is way ahead of us. The problem is that software is way behind. If you look at the undergraduate curriculum here, everything is still serial. You're learning data structures and algorithms for computers that no longer really exist. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I'm studying um, high performance, so I, I want to talk to you about parallel computing because I want to get people interested in this. Um, my particular area of interest is high performance parallel computing, which these days is supercomputing, which is awesome. So does anybody know what the fastest computer currently running is? Yes. <laughs> that's actually probably that's probably true. But how about um, there's a there's an international ranking of computers it's called the top 500. Does anybody know who's on the top of that? Jaguar and Crazy are up there, right? Jaguar is on. I think it's in the top 10. The number one supercomputer right now because they they come out twice a year. This list comes out twice a year, so it's updated pretty frequently, and everyone's racing to have the best one. Um, is an IBM Blue Gene Q model computer called Sequoia. Sequoia um, has about 16 million computing cores, and it has a speed of 16 petaflops. So a flop is a floating point operation, so that's like if you multiply two decimal numbers together, right? So Sequoia can do 16 million billion floating point operations. <laughs> so um, to put that in perspective, imagine if you could do one million floating point operations in a second. So you're sitting there, and you can multiply together two million decimal numbers. Now imagine that everybody that you know, everybody on the planet Earth, anyone that you've ever heard of or come into contact with can also do a million of those. And imagine that you make some calls one day and you guys all arrange to have a day where you, everybody on the planet sits down and writes out their one million floating point multiplications on a piece of paper. So in that one second, Sequoia could do twice as many computations as all of humanity combined. It's really fast. With these machines, we've been able to answer questions that no one has even been able to think of before just because they didn't think that the computation was possible. They didn't think we could even get answers to these questions. But this isn't fast enough. We're, we're people, so we get this awesome like speed and it autom automatically becomes a baseline. We're like, yeah, okay, that's, that's cool, that's fast. We need something that's even faster. So right now, the field of parallel computing is looking ahead to about 2019, where we want to come out with exascale computing. Exascale computers are a thousand times faster than Sequoia. Sequoia has on the order of a million cores. Exascale computers will have on the order of one billion cores, or multiple billions of cores, so it's huge. There's a couple of problems that come along with having a computer of this size, as you might imagine. Um, one is that an exascale computer is about the size of a football field. At that size, the energy cost of sending information to another processor is actually non-trivial. It would take a small nuclear power plant to power an exascale computer, um, the kind that we currently have designed. And um, even once you get that thing built, you have to pay for the power consumption, which is millions and millions of dollars just to keep this thing up and running. Uh, a second problem that we face with exascale computers is um, uh, programs. Like, well, actually, there's a really interesting problem first. The, the problem with large numbers. So when chips are manufactured, the manufacturers can guarantee a certain failure rate for their chips, which is a really great failure rate if you have a couple of computing cores in a single place. Once you have a 
billion cores, you start to see failure rates, like a core is going to fail every few seconds. So your computer has to be extremely fault tolerant as well. Now the third problem, and this is extremely relevant to us since we are mostly software people in here, um, is programs for parallel computers. What good is it to have one billion cores if you're going to do a program that sits on one core and all the other cores are like, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna sit here, enjoy. So that's one billion cores sitting there being idle. Um, to write a parallel program, you have to understand the architecture of the parallel computer itself and the way we envision that is usually with a multi-dimensional graph. So it's a graph that has tons and tons of connections with a, a very small communication diameter, or as small as we can get across the network. So very few hops to go to any other, any other node, on the graph. Um, so you've got that on one side, you've got the architecture of the computer, and then on the other hand, you have the problem that you're trying to run, like the simulation maybe, or you have to understand the mathematical structure of the program. And then you have to take that and then somehow formulate it and map it onto the parallel computer's architecture in such a way as to minimize communication so you're not waiting for a million years in computer time for uh, an answer to come back from a processor that is basically an infinite distance away as far as it's concerned. So it's, it's an exciting time. I think supercomputing is awesome. Um, even if you don't think it's awesome, parallel is a way of the future. If you remember from Max's talk, at the very least, everything is going distributed because with all of these huge inner networks, what you need is you need basically local communication. How do we do that? How do we do that quickly? So throughout your undergraduate cur curriculum, please, when you're taking courses like data structures or computer architecture, and especially algorithms, when you're learning these things for computers that no longer exist, keep in mind that how, how would I do this in parallel? Just think that to yourself all the time because they're out there waiting for you right now and in the future, and they need you to come along and improve them. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Are there problems right now that these computers are like taking a long time to solve, or are there like a bunch of like, computers like, that are like ready to do a process stuff, but they're not going to be able to do it? Absolutely, because, so we've got computers, and I can say that this computer has 16 million cores, or maybe in the future this one has 16 billion cores. Those are finite numbers, and there is no limit to the kind of problems that people want to solve. And there are, of course, problems that are computationally intractable as well. So we can get good approximations with them. But, but there are things where these are simulations that a few years ago would have taken many, many years to get an answer to. Just like you start your computer now, wait a few years, and we'll have an answer. Now you can do them in like less than a month. So it's, it's nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, so it's mostly science problems, which I like because I'm like a fundamentally curious person, and supercomputing is all about basically um, taking human knowledge and giving us the ability to ask questions that we never would have thought of. Um, so the Blue Gene Q, for example, IBM's whole Blue Gene line was originally optimized for um, processing genetic code. So that's a big thing, basically high data, high data things. Um, my advisor works with, or he worked on a huge project where they were trying to put together a bunch of different simulations for, um, they had water simulations, they had atmosphere simulations, and they had space weather simulations, but they didn't talk to each other. Um, so they were trying to put all these simulations together in one place so we actually had a whole thing for that. So what is a big one? Um, pretty much anything you can think of. You can do neuronal modeling, um, any, any huge simulation at all, yeah. Um, do you know if there are courses here in parallelism, parallelism that we can take as subjects? Yes, um, so the only parallel computing course that's offered is a graduate level course, but I know for a fact that there are undergraduates in it. So if you're interested in it, yeah, you can definitely get in. Yeah, it's um, 587. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So does anybody know actually how to parallel, um, to program a supercomputer? What's that? Mutex. So the standard right now, so there's actually a lot of like different like parallel things, like you can find things um, here and there, but the standard for supercomputing is still C and Fortran. Yeah, I know, right? It's actually, Fortran kind of makes sense still because compilers have a really easy time understanding what you're trying to do with Fortran, and so they can optimize it for parallel really easily. Um, if 
anybody wants to program something in other than C or Fortran, please come and do compiler research for parallel computers because that's a huge area of research right now, and it'd be really nice to have other options. <laughs> so, um, so the way you, you, you could write in C plus plus, right? Yeah, C plus plus also works. So C flavors. Well, I guess yeah, it's just C and C plus plus. So there are yes. So if you want to do so there's a couple of different models of parallel computing, right? So there's like machine <coughs> computing, there's um, a lot of parallel computers which are you can run different things on different computing nodes. The thing with graphics cards is you're running the same computation on each of the nodes and there's very few problems for which that's really useful. Image processing is awesome, but for most other things you can't, it's really difficult to get a good parallel program that is the same for every node. The other problem with um, GPUs is that for a long time, like if you have a high frame rate, for example, like you're watching a movie or you're playing a game, if you misplace the one pixel and you're off by a little bit, it doesn't matter because you're already like several frames past that. So GPUs actually have a pretty <laughs> high fault rate. Um, so they're actually coming out with a new line of scientific ones that are much better. Um, they don't make mistakes as often, but so that's something also to keep in mind. So, yeah. <coughs> Well, that communication diameter is one big one. So one thing I didn't mention about exascale computing is it's really awesome to have a computer that's that big and that's super fast and everything. Um, but what they're actually going to use the exascale computer for is to run a bunch of basically PETA scale simulations at the same time. Because you can't really communicate feasibly across. It's not going to be fast. Uh, but they can speed up an awful lot of research just by doing lots of runs. If any of you have ever tried to do a bunch of runs of like a very intense computation or to collect data, it takes forever. If you do it one at a time, it takes for like super ever, if that's a word. I have. So, so yeah, there's the communication diameter, which is already starting to affect us right now, um, just because of the physics of it. There are some other problems. There's a famous thing called um, Amdahl's Law, which is about basically there's a limit to the speed up that you can get from parallelizing a problem of a fixed input size. Like you can't just keep throwing processors at it. At some point, like you've stopped improving. Like the extra efficiency you get, there's diminishing returns. In fact, it starts to get worse because the cores have to communicate with each other and they spend all their time talking instead of actually solving the problem. So there's that, but it turns out that the awesome thing with parallel computers is if you grow the input size along with growing the number of processors, um, parallel computing is way faster than serial computing. So basically, parallel computing is really good at doing <coughs> really huge computations. So, yeah. Yeah, I sometimes get confused about the terms of uh, distributed computing, like cloud computing and parallel computing. Yeah. Like, uh, say I use a cloud service, like Amazon, I put my code on Amazon to compute something. Yeah. Are they using the parallel computing techniques? No. So cloud stuff is really more of a business model, um, and <laughs> I don't know. How to this. It really is though, because like basically you can go out somewhere, buy huge plots of cheap land, set up a data center, and then run a bunch of and places where they have a really low electricity price, and then you can uh, because everything runs on virtual machines on a same computer, um, you can just shut down um, the servers that aren't being used and just move hot swap all of your virtual machines over to like basically single machines and it cuts down on your energy costs for the computing thing. So basically cloud computing is really good for providing services cheaply, but it's all done through virtualization and it's not, they might take advantage of parallel computing in the sense that you could have a virtual machine take advantage of different cores, but they're not doing any kind of like parallel algorithms or anything. Yeah. So, yeah. We have servers in here, right? Yes. Yes, thank you. So um, Kane has the Kane Advanced Computing Center. Um, we have two supercomputers here. They're super, more like, more like yay computers. They have, like super computers. They have about 6,000 cores each. Um, one is Flux and one is Mix, those are their names. So you can actually go on there and use those and write those programs in C with some little, um, uh, there's directives basically. There's a language called MPI. It's the message uh, passing interface and it gives you some primitives that allow you to do sends, <coughs> receives, and some collective behaviors for uh, all the <coughs> processors. So you can write a, a program like that, and you can get access to the computing center, and you can run your program on it. 
What you need is a faculty sponsor, and you also need an M token now, apparently, um, which is part of, um, do you know what two-factor authentication is? I do, right? Yeah. So it's basically, for those of you who don't know, it's a little fob that is, you know, super stylish. And then it has a, a big number on it that changes. It's synced up with the server somewhere. And they're basically, it has a key and you have a key and they match and it changes every 50 seconds. So they went way over board on security. It was great. So you need to get one of those, but all you need is, a, is a, your M card. Show your M card over at Pierpont so you can see your points. And, and you've got that. So get your faculty sponsor and you can do it. They have one OS. OS is can also. Crash it then? What's that? Can you crash it then? Um, so you don't crash it. They're actually pretty robust. They used to not be very good. They used to crash all the time. In fact, for the um, parallel computing class, they used to give the students the key to the, um, to the room so they could go in and hard reboot the room. <laughs> 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 they were so broken. Um, so, uh, but yeah, nowadays, basically, um, the worst you can do is wait like for a really long time to get the results of your job back. But yeah, operating systems are actually really interesting. <coughs> they used to run like an actual standard Linux operating system on all of the cores at this on this particular computer. And it was terrible because your cores were all computing things at different times and like slowing down. And it was because the operating system was doing interrupts and other operating system -y things instead of actually doing computation. So nowadays uh, they have an operating system, a full one, that runs basically on the control core, the control node. And then everything else just runs a very stripped down thing that doesn't interrupt. It's a form of Linux. I'm not sure which one. Do we roll our own because you can roll it over the previous Probably not. Probably not. But yeah. Yes? What did you say the law for the return sign? It's Ombel's law, which I can write it out. Actually, for a long time, parallel computing, um, both the, the production of them on the hardware side and any interest in them from an algorithmic perspective completely died out because Amdahl was working, I think he was working for IBM. Anyway, he wrote some papers that were talking about the, the diminishing returns for fixed input size. And everyone was like, oh man, well, there's no point in doing parallel. <laughs> they were wrong. <laughs> yes? Um, are there any, like, for those of us who maybe aren't don't have time like to go to parallel um, algorithms or parallel computing courses. Are there like good resources for learning, I guess, kind of the, the like core tenets of writing within parallel algorithms? Yeah, so um, if you go to the, uh, the Kane Advanced Computing place, so they have resources. Their web page is set up so poorly because you look at like the front page and you see like the structure of the website, you know, the way that it's lined up. And you can never tell where like anything is. There's pages that I know they have posted, but they're not, you can't get them. Anyway, so, but they have a bunch of resources there that include a tutorial written by my advisor, and um, they have slides for MPI, the, the basically the thing that you put in your C code. They also give you instructions for running it on the SSH. It's pretty easy, you just SSH in. So, except that it has 6,000 cores. Yeah. Have you seen the Adapt to US Kickstarter project? The what? The Adapt to US Kickstarter project? No, what's that? It's like a hundred bucks for Kickstarter to kickstart to give you money on a bunch of soup. It's like a 64 core like Raspberry Pi for multi-board. Oh, that's cool. I just got my Raspberry Pi this past week. Uh, I was actually going to make something where it turned on my lights automatically by detecting when my little phone synced up with it with Bluetooth. Oh well. Um, but yeah. <laughs> that's super cool. That would be really awesome if you could have like a phone. I like that. Yeah. Any other questions?